tight. Scripture-wise, you literally only have to go to Mark, Mark and Luke today. Uh -huh. Amen. Now, for real, I, mean, I can't say for real anything can happen, but as it is right now, it looks like just Mark and Luke. Mark and Luke. We're good. Mark and Luke. I don't have to pick my friend up from the airport again until 4 o'clock today. <laughs> You guys don't have friends to pick up from the airport because y'all don't make it to the playoffs, but Patriot fans, we have, we have friends we got to pick up at the airport. I want to continue to teach about the power you possess within. Somebody say, my power. My power. There's a power that you have, so the dreams that you have, the goals that you have, the mission that you have, the mindset that you have, the, the, the um, wishes and wants that you have in life, they can be accomplished based upon the power at work within you. There's two types of power that you have to deal with. One is a spiritual power, and the other is, they're both spiritual, but one is Holy Spirit. Let me say Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Then the power of your mind, and how much you understand the power of your mind. Last week, <clears throat> um, we talked about the woman that had the issue of blood, and how the Bible said, does she see it? If I, the Bible says, she thought within herself, her mind said to herself, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I would be healed. And I taught you guys uh, a couple weeks ago that what your mind conceives, your brain receives. If your heart believes, your body achieves. Yeah. Amen? Amen? What your mind conceives. Your brain receives if your heart believes your body achieves. This ministry is a perfect example. 18 years ago, and it was actually before that, uh, this is, shoot, I'm still living in Toronto, but God gave me destiny. And so in two th early 2001, God began to show me that it's called Destiny Ministries. My mind conceived it. I'm an elder at a church. I never perished in my life. My brain received it. My heart believed it. And my body was able to achieve it. Amen? Amen. So I don't care if it's a ministry, if it's uh, Sharice with the Stani Salon, if it's if it's uh, uh, Spons and Bonda with their with, with Bonus and Alpha and Omega. I don't care if it's Camille's Fitness. I don't care if it's a degree you want to go to school for. Your mind conceived a bachelor's degree. Your brain, re your, your, your mind conceived, you going to school, your brain received a signal from your mind, your heart believed it, and then you eventually achieved it. Amen? Yeah. Because believing is in the heart. Somebody say that's faith. that's faith. But you can't believe that you can get a degree without studying. You can't believe that you can get a degree without writing the papers that are necessary, doing the exams, your midterms, your finals, your thesis or whatever. So that's what the Bible says. Faith without works is dead. And so you have to have faith, but you can't have faith. You got faith is believing in something. What do you want to believe in What your mind has conceived? It has to have something to believe in. Faith just can't believe in nothing. Faith has to have something concrete to believe in. It had to be a healing. This woman had something concrete to believe in getting healed. If it's a business, something concrete to believe in opening a business. Whatever it is, it has to be concrete and it has to start first in your mind. Somebody say my mind. my mind. It doesn't start first in the brain, which is a physical muscle. It starts first in your mind. And that's why you have to understand the power of your mind. So go with me to Mark chapter 6, verse 1. It says, Jesus left there and went, because we remember, he left where? This is when he had healed the woman. Remember, if you remember the story, Jairus' uh, daughter is sick. He's on his way to heal Jairus' daughter when the woman with the issue of blood crawls on the ground, touches his garment, and then she gets healed. So he's left there, so watch this. Stay with me on faith. A woman said to herself, I don't know Jesus from a can of paint, but I know what he can do. I never met the man, but I heard he's a miracle worker. And I believe the stories that I've heard about him, and if I could just touch the hem of his garment, he'll, I'll be healed. Then he goes to Jairus' daughter. They believe. 
that he could heal. And this girl he brings back from the dead. And so he brings back a little dead girl because her parents believe that he could heal her. He heals a woman who didn't even know he was going to heal because she believed that he could heal him. Now look what happens when he goes to his own hometown. Jesus left there after he even just brought a dead girl back to life and went to his hometown, accompanied by his disciples. When the Sabbath came, he began to teach in the synagogue. Watch this. And many who heard him were amazed. Mm -hmm. <sighs> Stay with me. When I taught, taught you a couple weeks ago, you should live a life that amazes people. You should live a life. People should be looking at you saying, man, I'm amazed at what you became. Because I knew you then. I'm amazed at this. See, it's only when someone can compare where you came from to where you are to they can then be amazed. Amen. So watch this. Amen. But watch, you got to stay with me on this one. It's see, where did this man get these things? Stay with me. They ask. What's this wisdom that has been given to him that he even does miracles. Isn't this the carpenter? Isn't this Mary's son and the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon? Aren't his sisters here with us? This blows me away. And they took offense at him. Oh, y'all didn't catch that. And they took offense at him. One version says they rejected him. Let me tell you what happened. They grew up with Jesus. And so they're amazed but the amazement, watch this, did not birth and we didn't get a hero's welcome. The amazement birthed envy. The amazement birthed jealousy. The reason they were amazed because they were saying something ain't right here. Didn't he grow up in the same poor neighborhood we grew up in? Right. Isn't he from Nazareth? Didn't he attend the same broke shoddy schools that we went to? Right. Didn't, didn't, isn't that, those were his brothers. And what, what they were saying was, how did he make it out? Uh -huh. How did he become what we're hearing? They say this man can walk on water. They say this man can drop knowledge that the Pharisees and Sadducees and those with PhDs can't even relate to. How did he get so intelligent and we went to the same school? How did he achieve? See, watch this. You will, if you're around people who don't believe in their greatness, they will get offended at yours. Amen. Oh. They look at the questions that they're asking themselves. Where did he get this? Well, the reason they're saying where did he get this because they grew up in the same neighborhood. How did he become this and we didn't? How did he get so intelligent? We went to the same elementary school. We all went to Homewood Elementary School. We all went to Oliver High School. We all went to Westinghouse High School. We all went to Brashear. How did he do this? It wasn't like he went to Sewickley. It wasn't like he went to North Hills High School. He, he, he went to Risenstein. How did he become so intelligent? Uh -huh. And which was messed up is, and instead of saying, wow, one of ours made it, the Bible says they got offended at him. They, 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 they got jealous at him. They rejected him. You may want to write this down. You, we'll personalize it. My success may offend others. Your, and it's, it's, watch this. Your success can offend those closest to you. They knew they said, this is Jesus. He's a carpenter. Then we knew him. We matter of fact, it's not the one who then he, he, his stepdad died. We know his brothers. We know his sisters. We know his mother. We know we know what project he lives in. Because remember, the Bible says he grew up in Nazareth, which was a very poor village. And so the problem with them was they had no belief in themselves, which meant they couldn't show belief in other people. Am I, am I helping you out? Yes, no. Watch this, because remember, he. Had, that's why you want to be around. Like-minded people. You want to be around like-minded people. Yeah. And because those who don't see greatness in themselves 
will actually look at you. Watch this. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Your life becomes a mirror that convicts them. They're looking at you in your success, in their lack of success, convicts them. And so instead of allowing conviction to turn to repentance, to change their life, conviction turns to envy and jealousy and haterism. Wow. Wow. So, so you may understand this. Watch this. Write this down because this will help you out. Many times those who lack confidence confuse your confidence with arrogance. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. You're not arrogant. You just believe in yourself. And because they don't believe in themselves and because you use I personal pronoun about positive things, they get jealous. See, they can say this. When you say, I'm going to school, that's an issue. But they have no problem saying, I'm broke. See, they use I personal pronoun to describe the negative lack of in their life. When you use I personal pronoun to describe the positive things in your life, they take that as an attack against them. And like Jesus, they reject you. And what? This is a man who was able to heal a woman that he didn't even know about. He said, who just touched me? This is a man that looked at Jairus' daughter, go to um, um, uh, let me see, go to stay in, we're going to stay in Mark, chapter 5, verse 37. I'm going to show you something. Because watch, he left there after doing this. He did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue ruler, Jesus saw a commotion with the people crying and wailing loudly. He went into them and said, why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother because he wasn't worried about them. He wanted to know, what about you two? The mama and daddy, do you believe I can heal? He took the child's father and mother and disciples who were with him and went into the room where the child was, technically the dead child. Her heart's not beating, her lungs are not pumping, her blood, the blood is not flowing, her brain has stopped sending out electrical signals. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha Kayum, which is Aramaic, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately the girl stood up and walked around. She was 12 years old. At this they were astonished. Is that what your Bible says? Yes. Now watch, you gotta, you, gotta, you gotta peek the picture. 20 minutes earlier, a woman who had an issue of blood for 18 years gets healed and Jesus didn't even know who touched them. Then he makes a dead girl come back to life. Then he crosses over the lake and goes to his own hometown. So basically, he's from Homewood, but he did all of this out in, uh, uh, on the West End. And then he comes into Homewood, and the people that grew up with him on Frankstown Ave, the ones that knew him on, on, on North Lang Avenue in Susquehanna Street, they say, that's, that's the carpenter. Watch this. They don't even call him by his name. So I need you to catch this. He just made a dead girl live and healed a woman. But look what the Bible says in verse four. Only in his own hometown, amongst his relatives and in his house is a prophet without honor. He cannot do any miracles there. He had just came from the West End and, and stopped a funeral from occurring. He had just came from the West End and the coroner was on the way up and Jesus left out the house and said, y'all, we good. He had just left the West End and made a young girl that was dead come back to life. And then he crosses over and comes to Homewood, the city, the neighborhood that he grew up with. And because none of them, so you may want to write this down. Your perception of God determines his power in your life. Remember Ephesians 3.20 says that God can do immeasurably above and beyond anything that you ask or imagine according to his power at work within you. 
The way you perceive God determines his power in your life. This woman perceived Jesus was so amazing, so incredible, so phenomenal, so majestic, so magnificent that she just stopped within herself. If I just touch the bottom of his robe, I'll be healed. And she was healed. The father and mother of a 12 year old girl thought Jesus was so incredible, so amazing that he could heal anything, that he could do anything that after their daughter died, they went and asked for Jesus to come and he healed them. And then he went around his brothers and his sisters, his cousins, his boys, chicks that he grew up with, all of these folks from his hometown and none of them looked at him as Jesus, the son of God. None of them looked at him as the Messiah of Israel. They said, ain't that the carpenter? Well, if you view Jesus as only the carpenter, all you get is a carpenter blessing. If he's only the son of Joseph, all he can give you is a son of Joseph healing. That's what the Bible says. Listen, he could not do any miracles there except lay his hand on a few folks with a cold and heal them. Watch this. And he was what? Amazed. Say it again. Amazed. Wow. God showed me something in the scripture. Only two things amazes Jesus. Two things amaze Jesus according to scripture. Two things. You only see the word amazed or astonished, incredulous, come out of his mouth. They only come out for two ear, one area, broken down in two different ways. A person's utter lack of faith in him totally amazes him. Uh, yeah. I can't believe you have no faith at all in me. Mm. The second thing that totally amazes Jesus is a person's incredible amount of faith in him. Mm -hmm. wow. And God said, ask the people. Which way are you amazing? Him? Wow. Let me, I'm going to show you that. Go to Mark chapter 8. Verse 5. Mark 8. Verse. No, 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 no I'm sorry. Um, so I don't want to go there. We already went there. Go to. Oh, man. I mean, I'm going to just. Go to, I thought I, I may have wrote down the wrong scripture that I saw, right? Um, go to Luke 18. Now, that's not the one I want to give you. Yeah, that's not the one I want to give you at all. The other one was, I'm going to just go off the top of the head. If anybody find it, you can give it to me so I don't get the wrong scripture. The other one was, um, remember two things that amaze me. Remember when the centurion comes to Jesus and he says, um, my servant is sick. And Jesus says, tell me where you have him at, and I'll go there. And Jesus said, and he says, you don't even have to go. I'm a man under authority and over authority. When people tell me to go, a general speaks to me, I say, yes, sir, and I go. I speak to a corporal, he says, yes, go. He says, so all you need to do is say the word. And then Jesus says this, maybe, maybe it's Luke 8, but Jesus says, I have not, it's the Bible says, and Jesus was astonished. Yeah. Luke 7, 72, yeah. let's go there exactly, thank you son, Luke 7, because I want to get you, I always want to make sure you have this scripture, Luke 7, and what verse? 2, Two. Two. Uh, can Jesus play it earnestly, uh, um, yep, thank you, it says in verse 9, when Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. When he left his own family, he was amazed at them. Only two things amazes Jesus. He was amazed at them and their lack of faith. He's amazed at him and his great amount of faith. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed at him. And turning to the crowd following him, he said, I tell you, I have not found such great faith even in Israel. So you... It, you will amaze him because just regular faith don't do anything. Lack of faith amazes God. Incredible faith amazes God. Basic faith is okay. You want to amaze him, but you don't want to amaze him the wrong way. Amen? Yes, Amen. Because he says, I can't believe particularly, watch this, for you and I, all that he has done for us, all that we know that he has done via the word, we should not be walking with lack of faith. Go to Luke 18. Oh, my God. And for those, I thank you, Holy Spirit. I'm telling you, many of us are lacking in life due to our lack of faith. Amen. Amen. 
Amen. Yeah, see, watch this. I'm going to break this down secularly. I'm not saying everything is on God. I'm talking about you are lacking because of lack of faith in self. You are lacking because you don't believe that you can go out and open this business. You don't believe that you can go back to school and get this degree. You don't believe that you can overcome this hurt and this pain and this pain in your life. Someone did this to you. This struggle occurred. This traumatic thing occurred. This molestation, this incarceration, this rape, this whatever has occurred. Family has died. This is that. And so you don't believe in self. And because, watch this, if you don't believe in self, it's hard to believe in God. My God. Let, me, let me break it down. This is what the Bible says. How can you say you love someone you ain't never seen and yet don't love those that you see? So how can you have faith in me when you don't have faith in you? Amen. Your faith in self will help you have greater faith in God and greater faith in God in self will help you accomplish the dreams and goals that you have for life. Amen? Amen. 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 So go to chapter 18 on the book of Luke because faith is not only based upon a person's strong belief in God, but it must be based upon faith and strong belief in self. God can tell you all day long you can do it. If you don't believe you can do it, it ain't getting done. I can tell you all day long. I can prophesy into your life. The Lord God said this. The Lord God said that. If you don't believe that you can accomplish what God said, you won't accomplish it. Amen? Amen. Powerful scripture in Hebrews. Say it in Luke. But Hebrews 4.12 says, The message, the word of God, was of no effect to those that heard it because they didn't combine it with faith. Yeah. Watch this. Jesus, can, Jesus himself could come down to earth and tell a person, I am the way, the truth, and life. If they don't combine what he just see it with faith, they will die and go to hell. So Christ himself says, I can't change your life unless you believe what I say about your life. <sighs> Stay with me. So faith is not only based upon a person's strong belief in God, but it must be based upon strong belief in self, but it doesn't end there. It must be accompanied by actions. It must be accompanied by perseverance. Somebody say perseverance. perseverance. This is a word for those that are trying things in life. It's not, listen. The, the, somebody say the struggle, struggle. is worth it. it, is worth it. And, the and the struggle is part of the process. Of the process. It's worth it. And it's part of the process, the ups and downs of life, of trying to accomplish losing weight, gaining weight, going to school, whatever it was your New Year's resolution, whatever is your goal in life. And you need to have goals. You won't accomplish anything without anything put in front of you. You have to have perseverance. So I'm going to show you in the scripture, this is not just what I'm showing you here is spiritual and secular. Somebody say spiritual, spiritual. Secular. secular. The principle I'm about to teach you, please hold on to this. It's a principle that says not only do this for God and do it to God, but also learn to do it to those that you need to receive something from. I mean, I'm explaining. I'm, I'm, I'm going to explain it. Stay with me. Then Jesus told his disciples a parable to show them that they should always what? Pray. Always pray and not give up. Always pray and not give up. King James Version says men ought to pray and not faint. Today's English Version says always pray and never become discouraged. Living Bible, Jesus told his disciples a story to illustrate their need for constant prayer and to show them that they must keep praying until the answer comes. Revised Standard Version says... Jesus taught his disciples to always pray and not lose heart. Praying to God and asking him for something, there is at times a time associated with it. We don't know the time. A day is a thousand years. A thousand years is a day. I personally have some things I have been asking God for since 1994. 
when Prophetess Mary Ann Brown prophesied to me at the old AMP on Kelly Street in Homewood, which then became Wilson's Catering, which Petra took over in 1994, it was prophesied to me certain aspects of my ministry. It was prophesied to me certain things that I would be doing as a minister and a pastor and a man of God. It was prophesied to me that that visions had been seen, that I would be standing in front of thousands of people releasing the word of God. I, it was prophesied to me these things. I have yet to stay, well, a couple times I stood in front of a few thousand, but this was not the fulfillment of it. And so there are prayers that I have been consistently giving to God going on two decades. And so the moral of this story is, it's not about when it comes, it's praying until it comes. So he says, in a certain town, because you got to stay with the, the, the extremes that he paints. In a certain town, there was a judge. There's a reason he says this, who neither feared God nor cared about men. He was just all about himself. He didn't fear God. He didn't fear man. He didn't care what was right. If you could, if, if Doug and Mike, Elder Doug and Deacon Mike had a case and I'm the judge and, 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 and Doug is suing Mike for whatever, I don't care about either one of you all. Doug offers 500. Mike offers me 800. I'm ruling for Mike. That was the type of judge this man was. He was a cold-hearted judge. He, he wasn't afraid of God. He wasn't afraid of heaven or hell. He wasn't afraid of man. It was all about the money. And so here was a judge that had the legal right to, to, to a render a verdict on a case. So stay with the so stay with this town. It says a town, a judge, didn't care about man nor God. And then there was a widow going to the extreme. The only thing worse than a widow during that town was a slave. A widow woman, which means she had no husband. But if you were a widow and you had an older son, you could be taken care of. If you were a widow and your father was alive, you could be taken care of. If you were a widow and you had a brother, you had to have some male to speak on your behalf. It was okay. It was still a struggle, but it was okay. This widow had no father, no brother, or no son. No male could speak on her behalf. So she was at the bottom of the totem pole when it came to society. It says, and there was a widow in that same town who kept coming to him with the plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Grant me justice against my adversary. The Phillips version says, please protect me from a man who's trying to ruin me. Now I gotta paint this picture. This is not like a courtroom downtown. How it was back then, a judge could go to Rome and pay off Rome, and Rome would basically give him his magisterial papers. So now he's a legitimate judge. He took those papers and gave him the right to um, rule on any dispute. He would have a tent and would have some assistance. And so what he would do is travel the entire city. And so just imagine Pittsburgh. He may be on the Lincoln Limington side for two weeks. And then he would go to uh, Squirrel Hill for two weeks. Then he would go to the north side for two weeks, the south side. He would travel the entire city. And he had assistance. So it was just a tent. And he would go, and once he came to the town, it was almost like, the judge is here, the judge is here, you could then go. And if Mike was suing, uh, 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 Doug was doing some work for Mike, and the work was shoddy. Mike wants him to finish the work at his house, Doug doesn't do it. He could, Once the judge came, he could sue. If Mike got to, this particular judge, not all judges were like this, if Mike got to bribe the judge, he would then rule in favor of Mike. Because he had the authority of Rome, Doug had to fix the problem, Amen. So watch, in order to even see the judge, he had assistance outside the tent. Most of the time, you had to bribe the assistant to even go see the judge. This woman is a poor widow woman who doesn't have enough money to even bribe the assistants in order to see the judge. But because it's a tent, she's able to look through and see the judge because it's a tent. The only thing separating her from the judge is some cloth because it's a tent in the middle of the neighborhood. All she has is the ability to say, grant me justice against my adversary. Your honor, your honor, please grant me justice 
against my adversary. That's all she had. She didn't have no money. She didn't have no favor. She didn't have no authority. She didn't have no juice. She didn't have any connections. All she had was boldness and a voice. Oh, that went over somebody's head. All she had was, and remember, he would go. So she would stay in Limington for the two weeks, every day at 8 o'clock in the morning. Your honor, your honor, please grant me justice against my adversary. Judge, judge, grant me justice against my adversary. At noon, he come back from lunch. Hi, your honor. Please grant me justice against my adversary. Five o'clock, he's closing up for the day. Last thing, your honor, please grant me justice against my adversary. He didn't even try to hear her. I'll see you tomorrow morning, your honor. Grant me justice. Look what the Bible says. For some time he refused to even let her come in. But finally he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she doesn't eventually wear me out with her coming. See, this is not just a scripture for God. Ashley, when you write for grants, if they say no, what you want to do? Contact them. Call them up. They, you need to be on their name. You're trying to get a grant. Hey, Mr. So-and-so, you, won't even, you might even be able to make it there. You got to go through the gatekeeper. But if you will call the gatekeeper 18 times, if you'll show up to the secretary 17 times, if you'll show up and notice that the secretary likes Starbucks Frappuccino with chocolate and whipped cream, bring her a Starbucks Frappuccino with chocolate and whipped cream, then you sit there and humble yourself eventually until the secretary gets worn out and lets you you see the person see we we take no for an answer no, no, no. I don't know how many you need to read the chicken soup for the soul series anybody ever heard of the chicken soup books excellent so we got some chicken soup people that you got in order for those see now you can do self publishing but if you want to make your money you need random house baker books or some of them chicken soup for the soul authors sent out their manuscript and it came back no Sent out another manuscript and it came back no. They sent out 1,100 manuscripts because no was simply a way for them to finally hear yes. So this is not just you banging on God's door forever. It may you be banging on the funder's door, the grant writer's door, the loan officer's door. I know they didn't accept you at the at CCAC because you only had a 1.6 in high school, but you keep on knocking on Devin's door. You follow him everywhere he go. He's at John Eagle. Hey, adjunct professor, how are you? He's there. You want to convince him that even though you barely graduated high school, your mind has changed and you're worthy of a degree from C. CAC and eventually you're going to wear Devin down. Man, you at the gym. Oh, you bumping into me here. I'm slow dancing with my wife. How did you even make it into this ballroom? You know what? Here is my card. Come past my office. I'll sit down and hear your story. That's what I meant that this is spiritual and secular. Too many of you all just want to bang on God's door. Go bang on the banker's door. I know he turned you down for the loan last year. I know PNC. Until you go through every bank. PNC, Fifth Third, Dollar Bank. Give me the names. First Commonwealth. First National. First National. See, y'all ain't ready for a loan. You got to tell you can say, Pastor, I exhausted every First National. No, you only went to the one on Wood Street. Go to the one on Wood Street, 5th Street, 6th Street, 8th Street. Go to the one in Wilmerding. Maybe they don't know that the, the, the one in East Hill City. Oh, not East. Mm. You know I'm old. We did have a bank in East Hills back in the day. But see, you want to not, until, then you want to go ahead and exhaust. You think one bank, you have 500 banks you could go to. You think one school, you got all these schools. You think one grant writer, you think one funder, you think one person. There are people that have been married 30 years. And they say, you know what, I told them no the first 18 times. I, I don't want to go on a date with you. I don't know what, and then something popped up. He might not be that cute, but that rest was, he, he, he's persistent. <laughs> and maybe he's that persistent with his finances. With his prayers. See, persistency pays off. Come on. So Jesus said, let me give you guys a parable. I'm going to go to the extreme. Because the judge ain't God. And he don't care about you or him or him. But his answer finally is, let me grant her justice. Yes. 
because she is wearing me out. <sighs> Look what it says. Listen to what the unjust judge says, verse 6. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Yes. <sighs> That's why Galatians 6, I told you we want to be in Mark and Luke. Now go to Luke 11. I'm about done. Galatians 6. Do not get weary in doing good. Do not become weary in doing good. That, that word weary is, is deep. When I talk to you about English and Greek, weary and tired. You can, anybody ever got tired? Yeah, that's okay. You can get tired raising your kids. Raising your kids is good. Anybody ever got tired of raising your kids? No, you don't want to shit. Look, the camera's on me. It ain't on y'all. You raise your hand. CYF, uh, that band, raise your hand. Amen. <laughs> You can get tired of raising them. Yeah. Oh, Lord. See, tired and weary is different in the English. In the Greek, it means to become exhausted to the point of quitting. Yeah. I'm done. I've thrown in the towel. And so the Bible says, and it's deep how the enemy works. We can get weary of doing righteous and have energy for sin. up in heaven saying, man, I can't wait for you all to get worn out for a, a lying, worn out through your fornication, worn out through your envy, worn out through your jealousy, worn out through all these things, but you got, you got satanic energy to keep on sinning, and then when it comes to praying, you get tired. Mm -hmm. I know it's, mm. wow. Wow. So, 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 it says, do, don't let us not become exhausted to the point of quitting while doing good, because here it is, for at the proper time. Yes. And our time is not God's time. There are some things I'm still waiting for. See, what happens when Jesus said, don't lose heart. You might want to write this down. When you stop praying, the prayer ends. That what you stop praying for and stop believing in, then the prayer itself ends. And so if you stop praying and asking God, that then God says, okay, you got to understand, I needed that prayer to continue for another three months. But because you stopped, I can't honor it because it had to continue for another three months. Knocking on that funder's door, that grandwriter's door, that banker's door, that, that, that uh, manuscript person's door, that editor's door, that, that book, whatever door you're knocking on, you don't understand. Sometimes it was the 104th knock that did it, but it wasn't 104. It was 103 that produced 104. It's the chisel, it's the man with the chiseling. And he's chiseling 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 and finally the crack begins to occur. And you don't understand the crack may have occurred after the, it wasn't the thousand hit. It was the 999 hits that preceded the thousand hit. That's why perseverance is so important. There are, there are no, at least through this man, lights. If it wasn't for, you study Edison. 900, it's crazy on this number, the 1,000th time was the light worked. And they, they said, Mr. Edison, how were you able to do that? You, you, you were wrong 999 times. He said, no, 999 times to find out what was right. See, it's your perception. And that's why not only for God that you got to keep on knocking and believing, you got to keep on praying for your kids. You got to keep on keeping on because you never know when that last love, that last phone call, that last word of encouragement is what cracked through. Amen? Amen. 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 So go to Luke 11. I'm going to get you guys out of here. Last one. You guys were great today. So that's why I see it's spiritual. These are all my prayers. But while you're praying to God up in heaven, he's wanting you to do some things on earth. You got some dreams. You got some goals. And say, Listen, man, this is a beautiful thing to know how. How I got you know so many different people at Destiny that have achieved some things, but they had to start from scratch. Amen. Amen. You know, young brother came to me today, brother J1, and he was just telling me his heart to work with youth and things like that, and what he eventually wants to accomplish in life, and you know, having a facility that would have a daycare and a this and a that. He's an assistant teacher, and you know, just has a heart for youth and things like that. And I was telling him, I mentioned Ashley, and 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 I said, you know. We have to be willing to start with just one. Mm -hmm. 
And when we went years ago, I said, as you start with one girl, and it was just one at her house at Enright Court, and then they would rent a room. They didn't even, y'all never did pay us, did you? <laughs> They would use a room for free upstairs on a Thursday. And, 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 and they would, yeah, that's when my Destiny Leadership Academy was up. But again, now you can go to our see these girls sleeping in there and all of this and grants starting to come away and boards starting to, to really look good. But it started with her just saying, let me just get one girl. Let me just work with one girl and try to help them. I know I want to have 30 girls at one time. You're not getting 30 if you can't work with one. Yes, sir. Amen. So that's the word I got for you, J1. You got, the Bible is clear with this. It says if you're faithful with a few things, I'll make you master over much. And if you're faithful, see, because she was faithful with other people's property. She was faithful with Gwen's girls. So God said, now I'm going to have Ashley's girls. Because you're faithful with somebody else's property. You want to open up a school, then work at a school for 10 years and be faithful with another principal's teachers. No, you catch what I'm saying? And so a lot of us want to skip, particularly millennials, want to skip the process because you guys grow up from a group that you can go on YouTube and, and in six months make a million dollars. That doesn't happen all the time. And so you got to understand real life success is grinding one day at a time. With one person at a time, Amen. with one idea at a time, that eventually, and when you have, when you see seven Serenity Living transition homes, it didn't seven didn't occur. It started when she was upstairs on the second floor with three girls. But too many of us get the vision, and we don't want to deal with the three girls. We want the eight homes. Uh, well, we now declare that. Watch this. Give me a title. That we have in, in, in connection to Jesus. We are his what? Children. Good one. Give me another one. Ears. Ears. Keep, all of you all are right. Bride. Sons and daughters. Come on, keep going. Disciples. Who said it? Disciples. Excellent. Whereas disciples also. How many disciples of Christ Jesus are on earth right now? Excellent. How many do you think that may be? Two million. They say about two billion, about that, give or take. So let's break it down. One point five bill, right now. He started with twelve. Hey, come on. Y'all want the one? No, I had to, and one of them was a devil. <laughs> so they knocked me down to eleven. <laughs> then I had to deal with Peter, James, and John. I'm asking James and John. Got the mama coming up to me and saying, "Hey, can you let my son sit on the right and the left?" So I got now you got two mama boys. <laughs> then I got Peter. He's impetuous. You understand? I got Simon and Zelda. He wanted to kill. I got all these different people, but I started with 12, and one was a sellout. In 2019, I got 1.5 billion. But well, we can name the ones I've had. I've had everything from Martin Luther in 1511 to Martin Luther King. I have everybody from the first black president that's a Christian. I got everybody going back to Oregon. I got apostles. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah. See, y'all know, but y'all understand, I had to start with just two in the beginning. Yeah, I had to start when, when, when Peter's brother Andrew came. It was just me and Andrew. And then John. And then Andrew went to get Peter. And I had to work with them and mold them and guide them. And I took 11 men. Because the 12th one really don't count. And then I end up getting all the ones that you now know. This 1.5 right now. But in the history of Christianity. There are 10 billion. But he started with 11. Amen. <sighs> How you are faithful what you start with. Lays the foundation to determine what you can build upon. Amen. 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 And I'm here, I'm telling you, that's why, again, I, I should love to share the different people's testimonies. What you are faithful with will determine what you may, Rafiq may have, the agent, he may have two clients right now. And that may, what's the, what's the, what's the show, Rafiq, you ever watch um, with my boy The Rock? What's the show we like to watch? Hi. Ballers. You watch Ballers? Uh, you said you go, right. Before you get the baller stage and have offices in Miami and New York, can you just have this one? Amen. Amen. Can you just have this one? I mean, I share this to everybody. Know this cat worth, you know, I don't know how much millions Chuck Sanders is worth, but we know him for Savoy and Urban Settlement and all type of businesses. Chuck started 
in his house in North Hills with a fax machine on a living room table 15, 16 years ago trying to get urban settlement. Lucked up with his relationship with Jerome Bettis because of the two years. Chuck, I think I got as many yards rushing as Chuck, yeah? I Googled Chuck, I think he had like 64 yards for the Steelers, but he did play. No, 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 68 maybe. 68, 64, they come, I had like a 32. So he, I love Hall of Fame numbers, but watch. Chuck, come on, we, Marlon, we know Chuck Sponts, Chuck was doing things way back in the, the fantastic plastic days. Remember, think, remember the, um, the calendar at Bobby J's? See, y'all thinking this now. Chuck is like, y'all don't remember the calendar of Bobby J's in the 80s. Y'all don't remember all the contracts I threw that flop. Y'all just looking at me now in my Savoy 1 Maserati, Savoy 2 Maserati, Savoy 3 Escalade. Y'all just seeing all that type of stuff. You don't understand. Y'all see the picture of me and Barack Obama. Go back to the fantastic plastic on Center Avenue. Go back to the, to the calendar days. Go back to when I was scratching it out because there is no Maserati 1, 2, 3. Four, if you ain't ready to try to do this 30 years earlier. Yeah. Yeah. Amen. Too many people look at a person's glory, but you don't want to go through their story. <sighs> Come on now. See, we grew up with Chuck. He wasn't, this chap was a businessman grinding, driving his daddy's trucks, doing whatever he had to do. And it took, now we can see it. But look, his success now is 30 years of work. <sighs> Am I helping anybody? So go to chapter 11 and I'm done. All on prayer. That's why you got to, I don't know how many times he kept trying and trying. How many businesses did fail? How many ideas that Chuck had didn't work? How many chances didn't go through? And he just kept on knocking. He kept on knocking. It's because watch this. Faith is believing in God and self. But you got to add with faith, work, and with work perseverance. Because if you're going to only work until you quit, then you might as well shouldn't even have started. Y'all didn't catch that one. You don't work to quit. You work to finish. Yes, sir. Amen. Hey, Dev, how much is an ABD worth? Nothing. Nothing. That's the person that went to, to graduate school and did all the work but the dissertation. An ABD ain't worth a GED. I don't care that you got 64 credits. I don't care how many things. Did you successfully defend your dissertation? Watch this, Dave. You're at CCAC. If you, uh, 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 Sean, you at Duquesne University. How much is a? I finished going to school in my junior year worth. Nothing. Nothing. That's not a degree. It does not matter that you started. It's about completing this thing. Amen. Yes, and we got a lot of folks that start but don't complete. Completion, teleos, perfection. It doesn't matter. God said, be ye perfect as I am perfect. Doesn't mean not make a mistake. It means start something and then complete it. Yes, yes. Jesus said in John 17, 4, Father, I brought you glory on earth by completing, fulfilling, finishing the work you gave me to do. Yes, the way you bring God glory, and hear me on this. Y'all ready? I know this will wake you up. You start bringing God glory, he may start bringing you some finances. Oh, we got a clap on that one. Come on. You start getting a name recognition based upon what you do. Money follows it. People start saying Dr. Devin Patterson, he is a great therapist, and so on. Money follows it. People start saying Camille's fitness, she's this, 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 and that. Money follows it. People start saying Joe Cabre is a great painter. Money follows it. I don't care what, what title comes after the adjective great. Great teacher, money will follow it. Great doctor, money will follow it. And you know what, thank you, Holy Spirit. What's better than money following it? Anything that's great that you do, joy will follow it. Amen. Peace will follow it. Happiness will follow it. I'm a great father. Happiness will follow it. I'm a great mother. Joy will follow it. I'm a great wife. Peace will follow it. When you can start putting the adjective great in front of your title, what good googly goo. Watch what follows it. But see, I'm a, I'm a okay this, okay this, then okay follows okay. Uh... Let me get you rascals up out of here. We got Oh, y'all didn't make it to the playoffs. Never mind. <laughs> My bad. <laughs> yeah. It's always next year. <laughs> that's a that's a y'all should have that in black and gold. Uh, Marlon, get one of them t-shirts. There's always next year. 
Yeah, yeah, black and gold. Yeah, yeah, black and gold. Yeah, yeah, Patriots, we, 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 we rock with now, but still, this is always next year. Oh, Lord, y'all ready? Let me five. Then he said this to them, and I'm done. Perseverance. He says, suppose one of you has a friend, and he goes to him at midnight and says, friend, lend me, he didn't even say give me, lend me three loaves of bread. Because a friend of mine on a journey has come to me, I have nothing to set before him. The key is, what time does he go? Midnight. Midnight. I didn't catch that one. Midnight. Watch the answer. Then the one inside said, listen, man, don't bother me. The door is already locked, and my children are with me in bed. I can't get up to give you anything. I tell you, watch this. So it, it was probably us, the way it was back then, they would put a big metal bar to lock the door. Then in a regular middle, middle class, lower middle class, probably like two rooms, and you had the floor here where the animals would, would, would lay, and then it would be elevated, and that's where the whole family slept on this big mat. It would be mom, dad, two or three kids. Anybody have to grow up with, in, the, in, in the sleep in the room with two or three, I mean in the bed? Just my mom, old school bed. In a bed with other people, yeah. So, hey, amen, we got some bed. So, it would be like that back then. Slept in the bed. So, what he's saying is, listen, you knocking on the door. My kids went to sleep. If I get up, I got to get up, get a lantern, get some light, go to another area, find three pieces of bread, take the lock off the door. Listen, man, it's a bad time. And so, he says, I'm not getting up and waking up a whole family so that you could give your friend three loaves of bread. So you got to understand even that culture, many people would travel at night because it was cooler. So that's why his friend had no problem knocking on his door at three o'clock, I mean at 12 o'clock at night. When you come to a, a, a friend's home in the Middle East, you always had to provide hospitality. But he happened to have no bread. But he knew his boy had some bread, so he went at midnight. Somebody say midnight. Because that's, that's a very powerful part of, of the story. So it says, um, I tell you the truth. He will not give up and give him the bread because he is a friend. Stay with me. I'm not going to respond to you and inconvenience myself because you're my boy. This is very important. Yet because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. One version says, yet he will get up and give you everything you need because you're not ashamed to keep asking. See, most of us would have been embarrassed to go over someone's house at midnight and ask for some bread. Admitting you don't even have bread at home. And that's what, watch this, what stops a lot of us from receiving is pride. My God, say it. But stop, listen, who the TL, TLC said, I ain't too proud to beg? Yeah. You can't be too proud to beg. Yeah. And don't wait to, listen, I'm talking about begging for a loan. Y so you'll, you'll start begging for it when somebody's about to die. I'm talking about humbling yourself to get what you really need to make you a better person. So the Bible says this man's friend would not respond to his friendship. He responded to his boldness. Yeah, there are people in this world that's not going to respond to your niceness, your resume, and your well-written grant. They're responding to your boldness. Come on. Come on. The boldness to knock on a door and ask for something that you think you ain't even qualified. Oh, thank you, Holy Spirit. Ooh, watch this. If you ever knock on a door and ask for something you don't think you're qualified to receive, you ain't getting it. You, 150, you got to believe. Me and Ashley were talking, and she said that Sean, her husband, would remind her every day, babe, how much you need? And she said, she was like this on her own husband. Oh, baby, no. Say it, 150. She said, I didn't even want to say 150. She said, I don't know if it was humble or whatever. And I got to say to you, if you can't say 150, you ain't getting 150. You got to say 150. I need $150,000 to make serenity live a transition home effective. This ain't me. My, 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 my salary as the, as, a, as, the, as the executive director of a, of a, a nonprofit only gives me X percent anyway. I need 150 for these girls. You got to have the belief 
in yourself. I'm a living example. Mr. O'Brien knew how much boldness I had. He called me up. If I give you a quarter of a million dollars, they're like, you know it. That's how bold, I mean, my boldness oozed. I see, y'all miss, I think it was arrogant. My boldness come out when I sweat. I shook his hand. He said, good God, that's a bold man right there. My boldness made him ask me if I give you a quarter of a million dollars. Can, we, can you maintain this building? So I want you to go out and have so much boldness that that person that can help your dream come true, you are bold enough to go to them. My man Rafiq, didn't know this cat from a can of paint. He's going to come to me. I'm thinking a little young bold cat going to come to me in my office. You know what he said? Hey, Pastor, can you call Curtis Martin for me? <laughs> That's a nice, y'all laugh, right? Hey, Rafiq, who I call? Because he was bold enough to ask me to call Curtis Martin for him to see if he can do something. The Bible says you have not because you ask not. And when you approach the throne of God, approach him with boldness. If he'd approached timid, if he'd have been a little sissy boy, I wouldn't have responded. If he'd have waited for weeks, if he'd have tried to ask Anjali, why don't you talk to your pastor for me? No, he said, I'm going to remove the middle man. We sat down. After about five minutes of small chat, the brother went straight for the gut, straight for the ass. Adam's apple pastor. I now know that you have a relationship. Can you call him up for me on this, 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 and that? His boldness is what oppressed me. Go down to that bank and ask for a loan, even if you got your finances written in crayon. You bold enough to go. Oh, see, y'all gonna put your I'm old school. Y'all get all your eyes down and T's crossed. I just go ask and do. Y'all go ahead and have everything lined up. I just, God told me to start a church there. What do we do? We started the church. I don't know no different. We went out to the, uh, the, 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 the comfort inn, rented the room, and started preaching. Grab, remember, Nike don't say just try it. Come on. It don't say just wish it, just want it, just desire it, just think about it, just overplan it. Just do it. Yeah. <sighs> Amen. My God. And listen, it says, I tell you and I'm done. He will not get up and give him the bread because he's a friend. But because of the man's boldness, he will get up and give him as much as he needs. And I'm almost done. So I say to you, and I want you all to write this down just the way. You know how fonts are? F-O-N-T? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> write down this and we're done. <sighs> Amen. It says, um, so I say to you, this is powerful. Ask and it will be given. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be open to you. Write it down like this and we're done. Ask and put it right next. Make it like a 12 font. Seek. Make it a 16 font. Knock. Make it a 20 font. Yeah. Ask. Seek. Knock. Watch this. Listen to Ecclesiastes, man. I'm, I'm so glad. Ecclesiastes level 4 says this. Whoever watches, this is powerful. Whoever watches the wind will never plant. Mm -hmm. Whoever looks at the clouds will never reap. What that means is if you're always waiting for the perfect time to start something, chances are you'll never start it. Amen. What's the best time to go knock on that man's door around 8 in the morning when he's already up? Kids is already up. But that would have been his friend would have had to spend the whole night hungry. 12 o'clock is not the best time. It ain't about the best time. It's about the time. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. And time is based upon boldness. If we was waiting for the right time and the right president, the right Congress, we would still be on the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. You have to learn to put your boldness out. So ask, seek, and knock. I'm done. Ask. Asking implies becoming humble as you present your request. Yeah. It shows you have a need. But everybody don't always respond to your ass. Seeking is asking plus acting. You can't just ask God for more knowledge of him. You need to seek him by reading and studying the Bible, regularly attending church and doing what you're taught. So you got to ask someone. But many times God won't touch their heart to respond to you asking because that's easy. Seeking is putting actions with your faith. 
And sometimes nothing is going to occur even while you're asking and seeking. You got to learn how to knock. Amen. Knocking. He is banging on the door. See, he could have went to the house. Psst, throw a little rock at the window. Psst. Yo, psst. Yo, Chuck. Psst. Can I get some bread? Just throw it out the window. No. Seeking. Finally knocking. Knocking is asking plus acting plus persevering. Mm -hmm. You knock until the door is open. So I say to you, ask humbly. Let us know that you have a need and it will be given to you. If it's not given to you, then seek. Put some actions with your asking and you'll find. And if that doesn't happen, knock and keep on knocking until the door is open for you. For everyone who asks receives, he who seeks finds, and to him who knocks on the door, it will be open. Give God a hand clap. I am done.